So I'd like to introduce to you now Dr. Eric Henriksen. He's an assistant professor and associate director for clinical research at the UC Davis Neuromuscular Research Center in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. I'm about to say a lot of really big words, so please bear with me as I speak slowly and attempt to pronounce them correctly. He's a founding member of the Cooperative International Neuromuscular Research Group and served until 2006 as the group's director of operations at the Children's National Medical Center in Washington, D.C. He's co-chair of the 20 Center UC Davis CINRG Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy Natural History Study, which has followed 440 DMD patients and their families over the past decade. His research has focused on epidemiological description of the impact of glucocorticoid therapy on DMD disease progression, development, and validation of clinical trial outcome measures and identification of sources of genotypic and phenotypic variation in DMD outcomes. He's collaborated in the development of bench-to-bedside models of DMD-focused translational research, and he's also served as a co-PI or co-investigator on multiple investor investigator-initiated and industry clinical trials. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Eric to the stage to uh, explain more about what he's doing. Oh. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, thanks to, uh, to Citrus and uh, all the folks who uh, put this speaker series together, and we're uh, delighted to have the opportunity to, uh, to discuss some of our work. Um, this is going to be a less of a... Uh, less of a technical talk, a little bit more about uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy as a rare disease. I wanted to point out that I'm speaking on behalf of our uh, group here with uh, Corey Owens, who's in the audience here, um, Alina Nicarici, who's one of our exercise physiologists, and my colleague Craig McDonald um, back at UC Davis, who is uh, my mentor, um, and then uh, Dr. Aranke and Dr. Carrillo here, and uh, Dr. Baichi here in the, uh, the tele telemonitoring and telemersion lab in the heart lab. Um, um, here at Berkeley. And so um, just in brief then, just to, you know, I don't have any disclosures that are related to the, uh, the topics that we're talking about today. Um, I'm going to give a brief historical view of DMD. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the common clinically reported outcome measures that we use um, both in, in clinical treatment and in clinical trials. Um, the emergence of person-reported outcome measures that are really more representative of community-based function and sort of the patient experience, and then the use of uh, sort of contemporary and off-the-shelf uh, sensor technologies to measure community ambulation and DMD, which is really the topic of the, the Citrus uh, grant that we've got, the development grant that uh, we're collaborating with, uh, with the group here on. So, um, you know, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, this is a neuromuscular disease, so it affects your proximal muscles. Um, in your core, in your arms, and your legs, uh, more severely than your distal muscles. So um, it's pro it's progressive, and you see a loss of uh, ambulatory ability by the early teens, and a loss of uh, sort of upper limb mobility uh, later on in the you know second decade and into the third decade. Um, and it's the most common neuromuscular disease of childhood. It's really rare. So we're between 30 and 50 per 100,000 live-born males. So that means that at any given time right now in the US, we probably have 10 to 12,000 people with DMD at any given time. And if you put that up against you know, something like uh, Parkinson's disease with maybe uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand patients or, or something like Alzheimer's disease, which may be you know, up to a million folks, it becomes very small numbers really quickly. So it takes us a while to find these folks. Um, the primary treatment up until just last year was entirely composed of glucocorticoid therapy, really uh, you know, c common steroids, prednisone, defazacort, things like that, that were focused on reducing inflammation and improving strength response in muscle. Um, the disease is X-linked, so it's, uh, the gene is on the X chromosome, um, and is, uh, the, the disease is due to changes in the, uh, the dystrophin gene and complete or partial loss um, in some cases of the dystrophin protein in muscle, which makes it uh, more, uh, more susceptible to strain-induced injury and uh, muscle cell wall damage. 
So DMD has, uh, so Alan Emery kind of wrote the book on DMD, right? And so he says that in the Temple of Beni Hassan in Egypt from 2500 BC, that he's identified you know, somebody in one of the paintings as looking like they're phenotypically somebody with DMD. And uh, I'm not really anybody to argue with Alan Emery. So we're going to call that the first uh, description right there. But then Charles Bell and Gaetano Conti um, and Little described individual patients back in the, uh, the mid-19th century uh, did individual case studies of patients with DMD. And then Edward Marion, who is an English physician, uh, was the first to really systematically describe a case series of these patients. And for a while, and it was in 1851, in four families, this was called for a number of, uh, about 10 years or so, Marion's disease. But then along came uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Duchenne, who was really kind of a Renaissance man himself, and um, he really created the phenotypic description of DMD and the disease that would bear his name that was used and is still used today. Um, and what he was able to do was describe, he you know, created all of these uh, the, you know, drawings of what the phenotype looked like with the, with the muscle pseudo-hypertrophy, so you have a lot of buildup of muscle bulk without, uh, without uh, um, uh, development of corresponding strength and what he was able to show in uh, subsequent uh, d uh, drawings that he did using light microscope and looking at individual muscle fibers was actually a replacement of the mus functional muscle fibers with a lot of fat and connective tissue and you know, gristle and fibrotic uh, junk. And so um, you know, what he was able to do to create a profile of this, of this disease using literally just a light microscope and a lot of very good perceptive work was pretty amazing. And so then that was done, 127 years. Um, there was not much more research done in DMD. Everybody went, kind of went, well, we know what it is. There we go. Um, so Lou Kunkel and Eric Hoffman, who was one of my uh, mentors uh, back at Children's National, uh, d identified the gene for the protein dystrophin um, in 1989, when Eric was a postdoc at Harvard, and subsequently was able to really characterize the location of this protein at the muscle cell membrane and the function of the dystrophin protein as a key part of a multi-protein complex that's now called the, the uh, dystrophin-associated protein complex, or DAPC. And what that does is you've got the actin and the myosin um, uh, contractile parts of the muscle cell, which, you know, for all you engineers, kind of rub against each other and they're electrostatically, you know, uh, uh, attracted to one another, and that's what creates our muscle contractions. And um, then there's the connection between the actin and the myosin and the muscle cell membrane up here through the lipid bilayer. And what that shows us is that it actually helps to take that mus muscle membrane with the interior parts of the muscle fiber when your muscle contracts, so it keeps it from tearing open. But if you lose that and the inside parts contract, all that nice, real fragile muscle membrane tends to tear open and calcium leaks in and all kinds of stuff. All the regulation of the muscle cell itself gets, dis it gets dysregulated and then you get an inflammatory process that sets up uh, pr uh, this sort of vicious cycle of inflammation and dysfunctional tissue repair that eventually replaces the muscle with fat and connective tissue. So we know now that dystrophin is present in almost all parts of your body. Um, what we're primarily concerned about here is with muscle, but you also have full length uh, dystrophin in the brain, um, in, uh, in the peripheral nervous system, and then um, also kidney. You've got some also uh, um, shorter isoforms that are present in other, um, in other uh, systems. And uh, also this, what this creates is a multi-system system disorder. What we see is we have some brain involvement. There is a Duchenne sort of cognitive behavioral phenotype that we become familiar with. Um, there's a decreased heart function and a progressive cardiomyopathy that you know, these days becomes one of our main challenges as these guys get older. Um, there's weakness of the diaphragm, which impairs uh, ventilatory, uh, ventilatory capacity and causes uh, problems with breathing and secondary conditions like pneumonias that are associated with loss of breathing function. And then you have loss of skeletal muscle strength and subsequently, subsequent to that, loss of bone, uh, bone strength as well. So 
prior to the 1960s, in the sort of Duchenne days, what we saw in uh, the normal natural history of the disease was loss of standing by eight or nine years, loss of ambulation right around, I mean, a little bit later than that, and loss of you know, hand to mouth or loss of upper extremity function that impaired people's ability to feed and kind of do manual tasks. And that all happened before the mid-teens. Um, then the 1970s to 1990s, people started to uh, use, uh, you know, kind of learn from like spinal cord injury and some of these other groups and start to use ventilatory support, uh, both nighttime and 24-hour ventilatory support to uh, compensate for the progressive diaphragm weakness, and this actually then kept people alive longer. Um, and then, with the start of use of steroids and also cardiac management using things like ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, um, and, and the like, what we saw is the steroids increasing the ages at which progressive function was lost by basically reinforcing muscle function and making those muscles stronger. And then, so all of those milestones, loss of standing, loss of the ability to walk, loss of self-feeding, moved down the line by two, three, four years in some cases. And then um, uh, now with the use of the cardiac meds, so now we've got patients who are much older who are primarily, you know, when they're, when they're older and have lost a lot of their skeletal muscle function, their primary management is really cardiac and respiratory. So we're really looking at hearts and lungs and keeping them breathing and keeping the hearts going. And these folks now, with this kind of aggressive management, are living many cases into their um, you know, third, fourth, even fifth decade at the latest, although that's still a little bit, um, still a little bit rare. But we now have taken what's Consider what was originally considered exclusively a childhood disease, and this is becoming also an adult disease. So we're trying to teach people from around, um, around the world how to take care of adults with DMD as well. So how do we measure now? What have we done historically? Well, we've, a lot of our gold standard measurements, things that we've done in clinical trials and natural history studies and you know, the like, have been laboratory-based quantitative measures. So we're doing things like, on the left-hand side, time motor performance tests. You can see in the top box, this is velocity um, uh, in meters per second to walk 10 meters. This is one of our simple tests, you know, ready, set, go. You time them, and it's actually very telling. And you can see that there's a progressive loss of function until our group with the 16 to 18, very few kids can do that. Same thing with this test of standing from supine. I'll show you what some of this looks like. Um, is, is also lost. And then um, quantitative strength testing. So you can see a picture here of weight adjusted um, knee extension strength. So quadricep strength, which is one of your main muscles that you use, right, to support your weight when you're standing or walking. And so that's a really important one. So those were kind of the primary kinds of measures that we had used. And then we started to come along and test new um, new kinds of uh, meds and, and things like that in clinical trials, and the FDA came back and said, well, that's nice that you can increase uh, strength overall, but how about, uh, does it make them feel better? Does that make them more functional? And we went, well, we're making people stronger. And they said, yeah, that's not really you know, kind of enough. And so we've moved to doing more you know, tests that are representative of community-based function. So one of the things we do is we've got the six-minute walk test, which is really a kind of a test of uh, endurance as well as strength. And what you can see here is that we have a group of patients who, you know, as they get older, we see this, you know, they, they are actually improving in function up to seven, eight, nine, ten years of age because they're growing. So their legs are getting longer, their stride length is changing, they're getting faster. Um, and then they progressively lose function to the point where they become non-ambulatory. And this is actually our current gold standard clinical trial outcome measure is the six minute walk test and trying to maintain people above this 350 meter distance for six minutes. Um, once you fall below that, you're really likely to lose the uh, ability to walk within the next 12 months. So this here, what we're showing is this is our first group's first Citrus collaboration and, and uh, Dr. Carrillo in the back here and Dr. Vaichi who um, I think it, it wasn't able to join us worked with Jay Han, who is an investigator in our center, uh, to develop this upper limb uh, uh, functional reachable workspace system using the Microsoft Connect. And so this was sort of the start of our collaborations with Citrus. And so they developed a very nice 
upper limb mobility system, which is also now being tagged onto clinical trials as well. And so this is, you know, we had been really exclusively focused on walking for so long, the ability to get in and start quantitatively measuring upper extremity uh, function has been really, really useful. So this is one of our, uh, just to give you kind of an idea of what our guys look like and to, when we think about mobility, this is a nine-year-old uh, with DMD from a few years back. Um, and he's, uh, you can see that he's got this calf hypertrophy. He's still really weak. He's having to actually get up on all fours and then watch him walk his hands up his legs in order to uh, get to a standing position. That reflects sort of his, all this proximal weakness. And you can see that his gait when he's running, this is his run, is really, that's the fastest he can go, and he's having to really change his gait and use more trunk muscles to get his legs up off the ground. Um, we can see kind of the same kind of pictures, oops, in this little guy here as well. So we see the same kind of standing pattern, and this is called the Gowers Maneuver, and this is a hallmark uh, uh, characteristic of DMD. If you see a kid get up like this, I can almost guarantee you he has DMD. This is also the ability to stand from sitting, another one of the milestones that we look at. And you can see that he's got significant quadriceps weakness. Very few kids with DMD have the ability to hop uh, on either two feet or one foot. You just don't have enough leg strength to get off the ground. And you can see here that you know, we have some, there are a lot of compensatory uh, um, uh, movements that these guys do to just get around on a daily basis. So that, not to make that too depressing, we actually have um, a number of new therapies that are in the mix, and one of the things that's just been approved in the last year uh, is this new exon skipping technologies, which actually trick the, um, trick the cells into creating a shortened uh, version of a dystrophin protein that's still relatively functional by uh, skipping over a mutated area and then continuing on to the rest of the functional tail end of the protein. And here's one of our little guys who has um, been in one of those clinical trials. And you can see, this is a, he actually has DMD. And this is the result of that type of therapy. He's phenotypically nearly typical. And this is the first time I'd ever seen a kid with DMD run up a ramp before. Um, it's really remarkable. So we're really on the cusp of trying to, uh, uh, you know, I think for many kids, uh, improve their outcomes significantly. But a lot of this is still what you see in the community. So the FDA is saying, you know, you really ought to come up with ways to measure people in the community instead of specifically in the laboratory because there are a lot of things that they're able to do that you might not see just using your time motor performance test. So these ClinRows are really objective. They're really quantitative, um, but they often lack meaning from a standpoint of uh, a wellness perspective. And then the other area that we've been working on is person-reported outcomes, specifically PROs associated with mobility um, both uh, lower limb and trunk in arm mobility. And I'm going to go briefly through that. And we, what we're trying to do is combine those and then ultimately have a way to, do, uh, to, to measure community function in a quantitative way. And I'll show you some of the ways that we've been able to do that. Um, so the FDA is really, again, just wanting us to find ways to quantify community-based functions. Um, and so this is a little bit of a comparison. This is around a paper we did a, a while back, sort of looking at six-minute walk tests, which is our sort of surrogate for community ambulation, versus one of our person-reported re person outcome measures. So we've got the PEDS QL, which was one of the very most common pediatric quality of life tools. Um, and we can see that on the, on the y-axis here, we have um, you know, the, the PEDS QL scores. And on the X, we've got the distance that kids are able to walk, and the blues are the Duchenne guys, and the reds are typically developing. And you can see that there's a relationship there between the scores on those, but it's not that. It's really variable, right? So contrast that to the panel on the right, which is from an orthopedic outcome-specific uh, tool called the PODC, Pediatric Outcome Data Collection Instrument. Um, which really primarily looks at uh, level of function uh, for, for motor-related ADLs. And you can see that you have a much 
stronger linear relationship that makes it easier for us to take a pod C score and link it up to actual physical mobility as we measure with these continuous measures. And when we do that, we can actually see that the clinically meaningful change that we want to demonstrate to the FDA actually varies depending on how weak you are. So if you're really strong, you're going to have to have about a half of a standard deviation, third to a half of a standard deviation change in order to really notice something significant that's going to impact your daily life. And you can see that the guys you know, way up high, you would need to increase your six minute walk distance by about 45 meters in order to really say, oh, I feel a lot better. But if you're really weak and you're only going a very short distance, you can be down in the five to 10 meter change and actually notice it. And we know that by then asking, you know, doing the clinical test, but then asking the patients to grade their function using these PRO measures. <clears throat> so that took us to gathering a large scale uh, set of person reported outcome measures from this um, uh, Synergy Natural History Study. And this is the collaborative work that we've done with our group from all over the world. And we've been following these patients since about 2005. Um, we used a number of different tools that had been common, that had been tried in different uh, Duchenne studies and kind of threw them all together. And then, um, so we ended up with 367 questions and about 2,500 person years of follow-up. This is sort of an epidemiologic term, but anyway, it's a lot of data. Um, and we wanted to see which questions actually linked up then with actual mobility and mobility-related um, uh, ability. And so we developed this score based on our time motor performance tests and um, actually breathing tests with force vital capacity as well. And so this goes through ambulatory status, can you walk, can you stand from supine, climb stairs, rise from a chair, and the gradation of you know, loss of those abilities and the ability to get your hands up over your head or have lost that with, um, your, with a, a, a low degree of pulmonary function thrown in there to boot. And when we looked at the correlation of the, many of the different questions in those QOL, uh, QOL measures versus that scale, that zero to that six point scale, what we saw was that there are a lot of questions that have a very uh, a moderate to high level of correlation with that actual functional classification, but we also saw a bunch of questions down here in those same instruments that really didn't seem to have a lot of relationship at all with actual mobility. And we see this when we drill into the pod C, which has five domains. We have the transfers and basic mobility, which is kind of core and trunk strength. You have sports, which is sort of high energy, things like running and jumping. Um, and you have uh, upper extremity function on the far right which is you know, really all of this reachable workspace kind of stuff. And then you have two other uh, domains down here, happiness and pain. And what we can see here is when you relate this to a measure of mobility, happiness and pain don't really factor into that. It's a different kind of paradigm there. What makes you happy is not necessarily your ability to get around, although they're clearly related. But what we can see is that when we look at these subscales that are related specifically to the construct of mobility, you can see the decrease in scores that are corresponding to the actual you know, decreases in the abilities of the patients when tested in clinic. So we went back to look at individual scores. We did what's called a rash analysis, which is kind of a, 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 a test theory um, based evaluation, looking at what your probabilities are of responding to different uh, Likert scale uh, responses in a set of questions, and we were able to start to kind of look at which of these questions works the best um, from the standpoint of having an ordered response, which is what we see on the top, to a disordered response. We can tell that those middle Likert scale, you know, on a scale of zero to, to three, the ones and the twos kind of overlap. Like people aren't sure whether it's a little difficult or a moderately difficult versus very hard. And what this allows us to do with individual questions then is to go up with different paradigms for rescoring them. So we might have you know, two question responses like, oh, this is a little bit hard or a lot hard, and people don't really um, differentiate between the two. We can combine those into one score, and then you have a 0, 1, 2 score instead of a 0, 1, 2, 3 score. 
um, and when you put that together in the context of the whole assessment, it tends, it starts to create a linear pattern of how these different questions are answered. So what we're looking at here, and this is, this is, this is directly uh, uh, related to the, the community walking that we're looking at, is we start to ask questions about what people are able to do in the community to get around. And so we have all these questions from different instruments that go you know, all the way from walking between rooms and you know, really easy things to do to th really hard things like walking a mile. And it gives us then an idea of how those questions line up in order of difficulty to see if we can confirm that those questions actually work the way we think they do. And here, we can see that you know, after rescoring some of these questions, they line up the way we want. And then we can also look at whether we have you know, gaps or areas that aren't measured and identify uh, where we need to create additional questions. So I'm gonna skip through this part real briefly. Um, suffice to say we found gaps and we've used them to develop questions on the easier or harder end of the spectrum based on other clinical evaluations that we do and also based on discussions with patients. But that we've developed this scale for not only ambulatory ability, but changing and maintaining body position and also carrying and moving and handling objects. So we have a global way to measure function and mobility in the community uh, in a semi-quantitative way. And so when you add these together, you come up with a pseudo-quantitative continuous score that you can see as we go through those milestones that we talked about before um, gets progressively less and less. So this becomes a scale against which we can test the efficacy of different clinical interventions to see whether we're actually being able to preserve or even improve function over time. And so again, this was our map of correlation of measures for these kinds of uh, tools and individual instruments just as a reminder. And when we've gone through the process of kind of recalibrating the instruments and the questions, we can see that our correlation between function and these individual test questions has gone way up. And that increases our sensitivity of our tool in, to actually measuring community ambulation. So why is community ambulation important? It kind of stands to reason. Everybody kind of goes, well, of course it's important. But again, just to, it's the major form of physical activity. It's how we get around. It's how we interact with people. It's how we do stuff. Is typically, we walk around and interact with our environment. Boys with DMD walk less. They walk more slowly. They fall more frequently. Um, and it's hard on the sort of psychosocial side, it's hard for them to maintain typical participation in daily life activities. It's hard to keep up on the playground. It's hard, it's exhausting to walk to school. You know, if, you've, if it's four times as hard for you to walk to school, by the time you get there, you're not gonna listen to the teacher as much. It's, it comes with you know, behavioral challenges, all this, you know, things that come from being really tired all the time. Um, and with this progressive loss of ambulation, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a functional concern because it takes people more and more out of society and out of typical uh, uh, relationships and abilities to do, uh, to function in the community. So Craig McDonald, my mentor back about, uh, back in about 2005, actually before that, started using step activity monitoring to create profiles of what community ambulation looked like in DMD. And so what he was able to show is that actually where kids with DMD really differ is in moderate frequency steps and high frequency steps. So it's the stuff that when you're really trying to get someplace, like the normal kind of just walking around, this is kind of a maximum pace for somebody with DMD. But if you're really trying to hoof it or run across the playground or play a game of ball or something like that, they don't have that ability to accelerate because the strength just isn't there. They're working, it's really much more like uh, an advanced sarcopenia like you would see in advanced aging where people just, they're weak and they have to work a lot to stay balanced, stay up on their feet and just get from A to B and it's a lot of work. So we see that in terms of step frequency and that's what the devices have traditionally been used to measure. And it's, so it's made them kind of like a suboptimal measure for clinical trials and it's, we see differences here. So you can see that as the disease progresses, 
Um, this is from a, a group with uh, Elaine Fowler down at UCLA, um, that the average strides per day in DMD decreases uh, uh, quite markedly, and that if you look in the upper right panel, the mix between high frequency steps and low frequency steps actually you know, diverges uh, significantly. And that um, sort of overall, that correlates with their ability to, uh, for their 10 meter run walk, uh, maximally attained velocity as well. So the slower you are, the less high frequency steps you take, the less you move around. But this also works in toddlers. And so this is that, so um, uh, Christy Bjornson up at, uh, up in Oregon has been able to uh, look at the same step frequency using step activity monitors uh, or the SAM units to look at um, what she's basically done is taken uh, the stride frequency and looked at the number of strides per minute and the average time on multiple days at that rate of strides per minute to create profiles of typically developing kids and of children with uh, cerebral palsy. And uh, she's done a little bit of work in Duchenne muscular dystrophy as well. And what we see in DMD is that um, the, those high frequency steps in terms of the numbers of strides per minute on the right hand side of the graph tend to go away as the disease progresses. And, but, this, but step frequency is, is sort of half the question, right? Because the distance traveled is really what we're interested in getting at. And if you think about it, if I'm going at a common step frequency but I'm only stepping in very small, short steps, I'm not gonna get as far. Um, so stride frequency changes with DMD progression with the high frequency steps lost primarily. But if we then think back to those other graphs, the time that you spend with DMD at those high frequency steps is very small. Um, and what you spend most of your time doing is being at low frequency steps. Oh, excuse me. So in typical human development, right, stride length changes with activity. So in a, in a typical average adult, you're walking, um, stride length is about, you know, 14 inches, and it goes up to, you know, much larger than almost double that when you're at a run because you stretch out your stride. And you're able to actually get using those quadriceps muscles and using those hamstrings, you're able to actually propel yourself forward but up and stretch out and you actually leave the ground when you're running, which is something we don't see in people with DMD. And, um, but the other thing that we have to think about is that stride length and gait pattern also change with age. And this is a pediatric disease and the onset of this disease is in utero. So what we want to do is be able to measure people as soon as we can identify them. And right now we are, we're getting better at identifying kids with DMD in their twos and threes, sometimes earlier than that. And in that case, then we're able, you know, we would like to have measures that represent their, their ambulatory community function um, even when they're really small. So we have to take into account normal growth and development as well. So one of the things that, uh, that we've been working on, actually we just put a paper in, and again, this is one of those things that doesn't seem to be that groundbreaking, but just helps us to kind of step back and think about the disease in a different way, is that maybe we need to have a sort of developmental adjustment for, for stride length. And it turns out, that sort of above the ages of maybe three or four, um, when you would attain kind of a more adult-like proportion than when you're you know, really young, your ratio of your stride length to your height becomes somewhat of a constant. And it changes depending on your velocity. So at a walk, instead of thinking about 14 inches with your typical adult, what we see is that um, and that's for a step length. If we think about stride, so there's a difference. If you ever hear people talking about it, we'll get really, really you know, grouchy about differentiating one from another. This is a step, 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 and the stride is when your foot leaves the ground and attaches again. So stride, stride, stride. And this is something when you're looking at data, you, looking at community mobility, you need to make sure that you're doing the, you know, doing the math to make sure that everything matches. But your walking stride length at a comfortable self-selected pace is about 0.8 of your height. And that increases when you're really hoofing it, that transition 
to where you feel like you want to run is at about 1.2 times your height, one, 1 to 1.2, and then as you get into a run, it increases, and beyond two, you're at a sprint. And so if you, you know, kind of look at, like Usain Bolt, his, his stride to height ratio is like three or something like that. It's really, really high. Um, but when we go back and then look at stride to height ratio and developmentally adjust those measures, relative, and we put stride to height up against our typical clinical measures, um, what we see is then all of a sudden we found a way to adjust those distances and those velocities so that it's, you get really tight linear relationships. And this is something that then we can put, you know, really develop pretty solid equations to predict, you know, from a simple thing like counting the strides during a 10 meter walk test and then measuring the time and figuring out what the ratio of stride to height is. We can really start to think about where, um, you know, what, one of the things that we've looked at is your likelihood of losing ambulation um, based on your stride to height ratio. And if I see a patient who has a stride to height ratio of less than 0.6, they're probably on the you know, decline in terms of their ability to walk. And once you hit 0.3 or 0.4, they're probably going to likely lose ambulation unless we can do something about it within the next 12 months. So it becomes a simple clinical way, you know, to predict function or to look at function relative to, uh, you know, independent of a kid's size. So Corey Owens, who's here in the audience for his uh, master's thesis, looked at, okay, so if we take stride to height ratio and we take these stride counts that we have from the step activity monitoring data, can we then try to impute community distance traveled? Because what we saw with the step monitoring data, again, is that individuals with, um, uh, we, we saw the, the, the drop off in those high frequency steps. But then, and that was really the only place that we saw them. But when we see the actual distance traveled between the typically developing controls at four to six, seven, nine, and 10 to 12 years of age, where we didn't see real differences in the four to six and seven to nines looking at step frequency, we can see clear differences in imputed distance traveled in the Duchenne patients across the age range. I'm going to skip over this. And so this is where we get to measuring stride length and why that's important and why predicting distance traveled in the community is important. So the problem has been, again, that we've got these, it, it's difficult to measure steps in using the same device in typically developing kids and in you know, kids with muscle disease. We see that actually the gait patterns differ as well. And so it makes it so that we have to set the sensitivities on the devices uh, to be, you know, quite different. Um, you see a lot of fore-aft movement in kids with, uh, in kids who are typically developing. And if you look in the sort of middle right pattern, you tend to, when you're walking around and kids are the same way, really kind of stay on your central plane. There's not a lot of deviation right to left. Whereas we see in, but what you do is you change your center of gravity going fore and aft. So you see movements in this plane, but not really in this plane. Well, the Duchenne guys are kind of the opposite, where they're working very hard to maintain their center of gravity very carefully, and it's always in the same, same place. But what you see is a lot of lateral movement. So if you think about that, like what, we have to measure them differently if you're using an instrument. So we've selected uh, with, you know, the assistance of the, uh, of the guys here, this uh, uh, accelerometer from Ambient Labs. Um, it's tiny, it's really easy, it's really inexpensive. It's like with a belt clip, it's $67. It's something that I could send to somebody in Montana and say, you know, have your kid wear this for three weeks and if you lose it, okay, we'll send you another one, it's not a big deal. Compared to some of the monitors that we have right now who are you know, hundreds if not thousands of dollars. Um, and they're easy enough and small enough and light enough that they can be worn sort of inconspicuously for days at a time. And so this is kind of where we are and they can integrate with mobile devices and send information via Bluetooth and via the web to central data repositories. This will enable us to do more widespread you know, tests outside of the lab, even on the sort of public health uh, national, uh, national platform standpoint. So the other thing that we've, been looking at is monitor placement. 
makes a difference, right? So the step monitors that we've used historically have been placed on the ankle, measures the stride. It's a little mercury switch, one, two, three, just like that. But in our Duchenne guys, and it was a little hard to see in the, in the pictures, but I, so I have to show you. But um, you, see, you see these guys getting back as they're trying to maintain their center of gravity, and they're working really hard to get their legs up and around, and they're sort of circumscribed gait like this. So using a mercury switch that just measures in one direction doesn't always work. And also, remember, we're measuring right now at the ankle. But if we're trying to measure this back and forth movement, which tends to work better, measuring up here at the top of the tree actually works better. So getting to the meat and the closing of what we're trying to do here, um, what we have been able to do is use these little monitors and train them. And Gregory and Daniel have worked on uh, sort of machine learning based programs to look at a training data set where we're actually measuring a distance and measuring a number of steps at different velocities. So we have our patients start off at a slow walk, do a certain number of meters and stop, turn around, go back at a little bit faster and a little bit faster and a little bit faster up to their maximal velocity. And so what this does is then by doing this on a fixed course and counting the steps, it becomes simple math to an, to an extent. <laughs> I'm over simple. Daniel's like, no, it's not. Um, and, and so what, uh, th so this training program and the training algorithm has been designed to do is filter out these individual patterns and variations in this, uh, uh, um, you know, in, in the measurement of movement in whatever axis it occurs maximally. We're going to assume, regardless of your gait pattern, whether it's fore aft or this way or up and down, that we get a periodic measurement of some frequency is to then pick out and count each one of these as a step. And by doing that and associating it with a specific g-force reading on the accelerometer, then when we go in, we can actually create this nice little graph that gives us an average stride length for each imputed peak on that accelerometer, we can add those together during a community-based motion um, uh, uh, event and come up with a total distance traveled, independent of any kind of like triangulation of Wi-Fi or using GPS signals or anything like that, which is great because people have a lot of concerns about privacy and, well, if you're tracking with GPS, how do you know where I'm going? We don't care. We just want to know how far you went. And so this gets us in that direction. So if you look at what we're able to then do is to take this calibration session, and then this is a still in the lab a community mobility session where somebody walked around, and they changed direction, and they walked really fast, and then they stopped, and maybe they sat down for a little while, and then got up, kind of representative of tasks that you would do on a regular daily basis. What we find is that this was 300 meters. We measured it with our little uh, mobile you know, track. Um, is that we're measuring it about 99% in the lab. So we're getting there. We're really close, I think. Um, so our next steps is to get this out into the community. We want to be able to describe distance traveled in day-to-day -day life outside our lab and do it at this 99% or maybe 98% degree uh, of, uh, of accuracy. And so we have a project uh, that's going to be working with uh, free roam data on toddlers from the UC Davis Child Development Center that we're starting hopefully in a couple of weeks. Um, and that will lead, that will get us toddler data to refine this algorithm for identifying steps even more. Um, and then the next step is to figure out ways to automate using some tools that Citrus and the, you know, Daniel and Gregory's group has already developed to automatically send the data to a central data repository um, and then use that to enable longer term community data collection for you know, two weeks at a time in typically developing kids and D&D so that we can really look at distances traveled. We have a Department of Defense grant that's kind of, that's in this area that we're going to be adding this particular sensor to, in addition to a number of commercially available sensors. We have hopes that the process that we've put together here is actually going to be better than the off-the-shelf stuff that you can get right now. Um, and then 
that's also going to incorporate the community distance traveled information with that lifetime mobility scale PRO question that I showed you earlier. So that's where we are. This is how we've been able to uh, work with our uh, colleagues here at uh, Berkeley and Citrus so far, and we're very excited about it. And thanks again to the, uh, the sponsors. Here's our lab. Uh, we're kind of all group Star Wars nuts. Um, that's actually Corey in the Yoda costume. So Chewbacca's our shortest guy, and Corey's like up here. Um, and also thanks to my literally like hundreds of collaborators around the world, going back to the, my Egyptian thing, um, uh, with all of our folks at uh, 20 institutions around the world who have put thousands of hours into collecting all of this data on the PROs for us. Um, it's really an amazing uh, job that they've all done. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions, and thank you again. So we have mics if anyone has any questions. I'm wondering, so most of the sensor you use is motion sensors uh, mm -hmm. with uh, a lot of emerging new sensors such as the heart rate sensors. Um, do you see that as a, um, another parameter you can use to uh, monitor the world's disease? So the question is whether we can use heart rate sensors in conjunction with, uh, with some of the other sensors to monitor disease. That's actually a point that I didn't touch on. I took that slide out just for time. Uh, one of the things that we know about people with DMD is that they have a resting tachycardia. There's some sympathetic disorder that goes with having dystrophinopathy as well, which means that your um, heart rate at resting is often higher than typically, but that as you begin to exercise, your heart rate doesn't go up. So what we see with Duchenne guys um, is that regardless of their level of activity, they don't have a really marked change in heart rate. And so from that standpoint, um, it kind of eliminates that as a main thing for us to look at. Um, however, there are probably other disorders which don't have uh, cardiac response uh, changes that you could do that as well and integrate data from other kinds of, uh, other kinds of devices and, uh, and channels, yeah. Yeah, sorry, kind of follow up on that. Um, actually, what I mean is, uh, um, do you see there are other parameters that maybe uh, the current off-the-shelf sensor we're not monitoring at this point, but would be valuable for those type of uh, uh, use? Hmm. I think that there is a, dis there is a, p when you have a global, muscle disease, um, there have been efforts to get, for instance, you know, surface EMG data to look at actual muscle activation. Those would be interesting. Um, there would be, uh, it, it would be interesting to look at uh, not only heart rate, but respiratory rate. Um, there may be some, you know, future biosensors. Uh, one of the things that we've looked at is using um, uh, near-infrared inf spectroscopy to look at actual b muscle blood flow through the skin. Um, and that's been very interesting. We've just got some initial data on that. Um, but that's, uh, th that can tell us a little bit about uh, the tissue oxygenation levels um, as well. And we're also doing um, portable uh, backpack-based uh, metabolic testing to look at oxygen and you know, CO2 and gas exchange during exercise. Um, so I think that in, to have a, uh, to have a, a unified sensor platform that can feed a lot of this data into a, into one data set would be really handy and, and helpful. I'm, you know, I think it depends on the, the, the expense of the equipment um, as to whether it's something that you could use on the community basis versus using um, in the laboratory. But, uh, but I think you know, a lot of what we're doing right now is pulling data from multiple different sensor systems. And uh, so having something that's integrated is kind of really like cool and sexy, yeah. Um, so it, it's it's good that you're looking at stride length um, and using inertial motion sensors. But I, my question is, um, so there's there's other aspects of the, the disease condition, particularly with you know atrophy and particularly other muscle groups. So I guess, mm -hmm. are you interested in looking into uh, different types of muscle groups to examine as well? So potentially like hand exercises might be another thing. 
And oh, sure. So there, and it depends on the kind of activity that you're looking at as well. There's a huge effort going on amongst um, multiple universities looking at um, using some of our synergy data and um, uh, with the, from our natural history study, and then looking at similar patients and uh, and with muscle MRI to look at MRI fat fraction across multiple different muscle groups involved in both walking and upper limb function as well, and looking at the uh, differential involvement of the disease in different muscle groups and how that then relates to um, both uh, clinically measured function and day-to-day -day, uh, function as well. So there, there is a progression of, um, it's, all muscles are not equally affected. So when we see this progressive loss of function, it's really directly associated with, um, with the muscles that are most involved uh, to the muscles that are least involved. And, uh, am I permitted to ask one more question? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so it's it's great that you're able to get 99% of the stride length in the research facility, but the, the challenge always comes down to, especially when you're when you think about commercializing a product like this, it's it's how you do it in like a house setting or like a typical standard wadding sickness setting. So I guess my, my question to you is, have you have you thought about how you're going to address that challenge or? And a lot of that has uh, you know come down to ways to. Uh, port the data in the home or, you know, the, the, the measurement tools themselves right now have fairly limited storage capacity. So, you know, they're often kind of in a way, they'll collect data and then they need to be near a mobile device where they can push it up uh, to a central repository. Um, we have to think about ways to really enable that in the home setting um, as well as the lab. And then, uh, you know, there are issues of wearability. How often do you get people to actually put them on the correct way? You know, we've learned a lot from, the, from what we've done with the, uh, the more uh, simple unidirectional step monitors. But um, we still, there are a lot of things in community life that, you know, we're still really know, we know we're measuring steps because we're making people do steps, we're videoing them. Um, but things like, you know, this, well, how does that count? What happens when, we think sitting and standing is pretty okay, but there are a lot of uh, things like the kids do crawling around on the floor, rolling up and down a hill, that um, we're gonna need to do a lot of observational work and then compare that, you know, videos of kids doing things to the actual data stream that we're capturing. And I think that down the line, um, you know, one of the goals would be to start creating uh, profiles of what some of those different, more common activities actually look like. Because I think you're right. If we're only if we're only looking at walking at different speeds or running at different speeds, we're still going to have a lot of either undercounting or overcounting, and um, and that goes along. That that that's also true of people of different statures, different sort of body composition. There's differences in leg length versus torso length. We're going to have to drill into that more. Um, so I think there's Nothing is going to be ready right off the bat to go into a commercial product, but it's kind of a step from where we started, and uh, I think it's going to open up a lot of interesting new questions that we'll have to solve. Sir. So most of the, uh, w the work that I saw is very specific to DMD, and mm -hmm. my question is, do you see this generalizable to other conditions, or do you think every conditions, uh, for every condition, we're gonna have to start from scratch and develop models specific to that. There may be differences. For instance, we see a very characteristic gait in DMD, right? We see the sway back and forth. But the other thing that we have to think about is that we're trying to measure both atypical and typical gaits here. So we're trying to look at a range of different gait patterns. And um, many of those weakness-related gait patterns are often, when we, when we start to substitute for weak muscles, we often do it in, the, in a manner that's sort of the most mechanically efficient um, for us or, or, or metabolically efficient for us. And so what you see across um, different diseases is there are more similarities than there are differences. So you know, application of this kind of technology um, in, for instance, uh, uh, age-related sarcopenia in, uh, in uh, you know, the advanced elderly, in people with, uh, with disorders that are less symmetrical, like cerebral palsy, for instance, um, where they may be affected more on one side than another. Um, we're gonna have to figure out how to 
better measure those. We're actually really lucky. We have a new investigator coming on uh, on board in Davis and we're getting a really cool split belt treadmill that actually will allow us to measure people in the lab at those you know, with, with stride lengths that differ um, you know, bilaterally. So I think we're gonna, we'll go in that direction eventually. And I think that there's more <laughs> crossover than make, if, if this is just a disease specific thing, it'll be great for us, but I think it's got a wider utility. Last question. So congratulations on your progress to well, date. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> These guys. I have a, yeah. They're wonderful. <laughs> uh, question about di disease progression. Have you started to explore different exercise training modalities to affect disease pro progression? Yes. As a matter of fact, it used to be that the lore was that exercise for people with muscle disease is bad. Um, and one of the things that has been uh, uh, found you know, probably in the last 10 years or so is we're amending that to say eccentric contractile muscle exercise is bad. And by that I mean anything that involves a lengthening contracture of the muscle. So if you've ever been to the gym and worked out on really heavy weights and you're fine that day but you wake up the next morning and you're like, oh my gosh, I can barely move my arms you know, above, above this level. It's because you created a lot of damage to your muscle cell membranes, and that's primarily due to eccentric load on the, on the muscle itself. And so what we see in DMD is that their resistance to eccentric damage is significantly lower, so it's that they get that all the time, just through regular, uh, through regular activity. But if you can find ways to exercise people by, through, and, and eliminate that eccentric load, um, then you can see a strength training effect. And one of the best ways to do that is actually underwater. So when, if you think about it, when you're doing um, this type of activity, like you would do for a bicep curl, right now you've got a concentric load on the bicep and then an eccentric load on the bicep. And that's that letting it go and letting it lengthen is where you develop all that damage. And that's why you're sore the next day. If you do the same kind of motion in the water, you're gonna find that the next day you're not sore or you're not as sore. And the reason behind that is that you're doing a concentric contraction of your bicep and a concentric contraction of your tricep on the other side. So you're using that contralateral muscle instead of working against gravity. And so if you can minimize the eccentric contractile load on the muscle and still exercise it, people do get stronger. Yeah, so there's a lot of parallels with sports medicine rehab. Yes, absolutely, for sure. Um, can I have everyone uh, join me in thanking Dr. Henriksen? Uh, Thank you.